Hi everybody. In the last video, we had a look at the inside of this beautiful electrostatic voltmeter with a maximum input sensitivity of 5,000 volts, AC or DC. And we're going to look at it again. This time we're going to look at it in operation, hook it up to a high voltage source and, and see how it stacks up to some modern day digital alternatives. So this voltage divider network I made quite a few years ago, it's got 10 300 meg ohm 1% power resistors all in series in this zigzag pattern, all wired, soldered very nicely and neatly on the other side here and going to these binding posts at every single solder joint end put together in this whole plexiglass structure here so I can lay it down like that. I can lay it down standing up like this or I can even stand it up that way if I'm hard up for table space and I want to keep all my high voltage um, terminals or conductors at a very high elevated level then I can just have something coming up here and dropping down to lower voltages down at the bottom where it's safe. And as for maximum capacity of this thing, I estimate 200,000 volts. So basically 20,000 volts per resistor right here. And that's just based on the spacing. And if you exceed 20,000 volts, you might start to get to some, some uh, surface sparking going across the, these resistors or maybe on the, the perf board back here. But yeah, 200,000 volts is what I could put on it. This meter only has a 5,000 volt capacity. Now, I don't have a 5,000 volt source with me right now. I do have something like what you can find in a typical TV or a CRT display, like my green television CRT that I worked on a few weeks ago. But I think I'm going to take apart this thing right here, this AT&T computer terminal which I have uh, just hooked up the video signal straight to 5 volts so it's just constant yellow on the, the yellow phosphor CRT in there and we can get the 12 kilovolt DC voltage source off of that hook it up to my voltage divider network and send that into this thing and also compare it to this which is a uh, I was going to say fluke, but it's Keithley, Keithley 1600 high voltage probe. Let me take it out of this big metal base that I have here. There it is. Keithley model 1600, 40 kilovolt capacity. It works, of course, extremely well at DC and low frequency AC. So, you know, 60 hertz would be pretty good. Plus minus a couple percent, I think is what it's rated for. Something like that. Goes straight into a, a DMM like this with a 10 megohm impedance. The, the main body of this probe right here inside the, the red stick is very long 999 megohm resistor. And then the bottom, there's another 1.1 meg ohm resistor that gets hooked up in parallel to the 10 meg ohm impedance of your typical handheld DMM for an equivalent parallel of 999 kilo ohm, which is almost exactly going to be one tenth of or one one thousandth of the sum resistance of the whole thing. Very basic voltage divider. 1000 to 1 network right there. Here's the setup. Got the, the anode voltage coming out right there and going over to my custom network wired as a 4 to 1 voltage divider going into the, the uh, Sensitive Research Instrument Corporation 5 kilovolt electrostatic voltmeter. It also goes to the Keithley 1000 to 1 voltage divider into the fluke multimeter down here. So let me just train the camera on the two meters, flip the switch, and we'll see what happens. And there we go, charging up, and it is right on target. Oh, what the heck happened there? 
the picture is still showing up a nice bright yellow okay so I guess what happened maybe is the uh, the flyback circuit over here must have charged up straight to a 12 kilovolt output but that was before the heater started turning on and shooting electrons out there and that would that excess current would then drop the output of the flyback circuit dropping it down to 10 kilovolts on uh, right there 10.1 kilovolts basically and what do we have here 2525 volt basically and of course there it is 10,100 volt coming out there pretty much what we're reading right here give or take half a percent or so not bad now with this 10 kV reading the CRT brightness is turned up at maximum let's turn it down so we can increase the output voltage here and see what we get so there's 12 kV on the Fluke DMM but on the sensitive research we're only getting 2975 volt which if you multiply by 4 is 11,900 volt and that's only 100 volt difference so 100 divided by 12,000 volt is going to be less than 1% of course less than 1% difference between the analog and digital readings and just to check to make sure that the fluke multimeter is working fine I got another model right here hooked up and we're looking pretty much the same thing 12.0 something on this one and another 2975 showing up on that scale over there now I just want to play with a different voltage ratio right here I've got the the, the flyback anode voltage going up here to a 9 to 3 voltage ratio going into the electrostatic voltmeter and again comparing it to the the fluke multimeter hooked up to the Keithley 1000 to 1 voltage divider let's turn it on and we should be seeing 4000 volts on the electrostatic and uh, yeah I'm seeing basically 4,020, 4,025 volts. Now here we have a much closer match. Look at that. 12,075 versus 12,072 on that one. Beautiful. And I just turned up the brightness, which turns down the output voltage. And we're showing right here 3,325 volts on the analog scale multiply by three and we get 9975 which is about 50 volts off of that thing right there and of course that works out to 0.5 percent very very close very very nice as a matter of fact according to the label right here we have an accuracy guarantee of one percent so anything less than that is absolutely beautiful and and within spec just for kicks one more voltage division here of 10 to 5 going down into the electrostatic and we'll see what we get here compared to this thing since the CRT power supply is putting out almost exactly 10 kV let me turn it on here and of course it's going to peg once we uh, when you first flip it on to 12 kV there but it should drop pretty soon and it looks pretty good so the camera might show it a little bit before the five kilovolt but I can look straight on there and it's just a little bit after the five kilovolt on the scale right there and that's uh, that's very nice and a little note on safety both for your measuring equipment and your other electronics in your circuit it's very important to maintain wide spacing between your your wires I took the camera off the tripod here so we can get a, a relatively 3d view and I'm even gonna hold back the the microphone cable gotta hold it back so it doesn't come into 
close proximity of all these other high voltage lines which are energized right now to 10,000 volts and um, yeah like I said very important to maintain very wide distances between these you can't really rely on the insulation because in most cases like this this Pomona Model B12 not very nice good quality banana jack that's only rated for 1000 volt I think 1000 volts and of course this green insulation here on these banana jack or uh, alligator clip leads that might be only 300 volt rating so when you energize this stuff with 10 kilovolts or any any amount of high voltage above what it's rated for you always got to keep spacing into account and just make sure that you know what you're doing. I've been doing this for 15 years and I haven't killed myself yet, although I have had a couple of close calls. So please be careful if you do anything like this. Okay, I want to take a brief detour from the analog meter now and just have a look at the, the high voltage measurement capa capabilities of this meter, or rather, I shouldn't say high voltage, I should say high impedance because on the millivolt range right here we have a high Z option and if I push that button right there that takes it into high Z and that gives it an uh, input impedance of greater than 10 or I'm sorry greater than 1 gig ohm so here's the specs for this 860 series we're looking at an 867B graphical multimeter and input impedance high z 10,000 or 1,000 meg ohm input impedance right there the disadvantage though is that it only has a two volt capacity uh, you can only put two volts maximum on the millivolt range but that's just fine if we can break it down via this thing right here with a 10,000 to 1 ratio then we can easily measure 12 kV or 10 kV and on this thing we can get 1.2 or just 1 volts respectively. Now I have had to make a minor adjustment right here and that's this little tiny ordinary 5% tolerance 300 kilo ohm resistor right there and that's going to be the, the low voltage um, the, the, low, the lower part of the voltage divider the upper part is every single one of these resistors all in series, three gig ohms. We got the high voltage going in up here and low voltage coming in, coming out all the way from the bottom. Okay, let's flip on the terminal. And look at that. Wow, I'm impressed. That is very, very close measurements between the two of them so the fluke 85 is on the the keithley uh, voltage divider of course 1000 to ones we're looking at 10.17 kilovolt and here we have 10.2 kilovolt very very close look at that and again that difference could be attributed to the fact that i'm using an ordinary five percent tolerance carbon film resistor down there uh, this is just just a rough introduction to this thing's capability i really haven't actually measured this thing with uh, the high z impedance i haven't had to use the high z impedance on this thing yet in the time that i've had it so yeah i'm very impressed this is this is beautiful this works wonderfully so now I just turned down the CRT brightness and we've got the voltage coming out to 12 kV. Again, very, very close match. I'm not even going to bother to calculate the percent error with that. But yeah, I just wanted to play around with, uh, with this thing right here, this Fluke graphical multimeter, and play around with the, with the high impedance input of 1 gig ohm. Um, I could potentially use something like a Keithley 2000 multimeter, benchtop multimeter. That's got something more like one terohm input impedance on low voltage ranges. 
I just want to put some things in perspective when we have a comparison between the analog electrostatic voltmeter and some other digital electrostatic voltmeters that you can possibly get. Okay, so here's my back of the envelope, quite literally back of the envelope comparison between analog and digital meters right here, or electrostatic voltmeters, I should say. Now, I've only, as a disclaimer, I should say that I've only used this electrostatic analog voltmeter, and I have never used any digital electrostatic voltmeter, never even seen one. Everything I've got right here is just based on half hour of Googling. That's, that's all I'm going by. So take my advice with a grain of salt. First of all, analog lower cost. In most cases, much lower cost. Um, I found that these are only available on eBay. Apparently, they're not making these anymore. Nobody's making, making them. Maybe some physics, uh, physics classroom company might be making some electrostatic voltmeters just for educational purposes. I couldn't find any, but the digital are still certainly being produced. You can still get brand new digital multimeters or digital electrostatic meters, but of course for a much higher cost than the analog. Analog, um, easy to understand, explain, you know, very, very basic physics. Now with digital electrostatic voltmeters, there's two different types I found available. There's the contact type and non-contact type. So you can even get non-contact electrostatic voltmeters where you don't actually have to hook up a physical copper wire or anything. You can just use the electric field. In some cases, you have to have the, the probe uh, at a certain distance from the thing that you're measuring, or it could have a wide range from perhaps one centimeter to five centimeters or something with very low percent error between all those distances. You can still get a reasonable approximation of what you're reading but that's really just for electrostatic um, uses when you want to mess around with with sensitive electronics and you don't want to damage them with ESD discharge that's where that would become in handy certainly not for high precision high accuracy electrostatic measurements also with digital they very often come with the option to output uh, an analog signal to recording instruments, any kind of analog vo voltage that's proportional to what it's actually reading. And also linear digital meters are pretty much going to be linear scale. And we saw already how very non-linear this thing is. Now, another advantage of the analog meter is that it's immune to low energy overload. And I stress low energy because obviously if you discharge, a, you know, 2000 joule capacitor bank into this thing, it's going to blow up molten aluminum all over on the inside of that thing. So certainly low energy, maybe something from an induction coil, it might be able to survive that. But anything higher energy than that is just going to completely fry the aluminum plates in there, make various imperfections, at least make some imperfections, which would then affect the, the overall uh, performance of this thing. And of course, AC and DC operation, this thing handles it very well, both DC and and AC at least in low frequency. We saw in the previous video that once you go above 1000 Hertz, you have to take the impedance into account, the AC impedance because of the capacitive plates. But beyond that, it's really not that bad with AC. It's whereas all the, the digital meters I was looking at, it seems like they were all DC. I didn't really find any AC ones. And then finally, We've got that old school feeling with the analog one. Very, very nice. If you want to have an old school project or if, if, you just, if you're just doing this thing on the side in your own spare time, it's always more fun to play around with these analog meters than it is with the digital ones. And also input impedance, question mark. I'm not so sure how these things compare with the input impedance. 
Of course, this thing is going to have extremely high input impedance in the tera ohm or um, peta ohm range. I think peta comes after tera, but with this thing right here or any kind of digital um, electrostatic voltmeter, um, at least with the contact type, you can have something like a tera ohm or something like that. But with uh, the non-contact typo, well, that's just a probe that you have floating around in free air. And again, that's pretty much the same as this. You got two different plates in free air and another one with two different plates in free air. And so, and so I think the input impedance could be comparable between the, the two different technologies. Now I want to discuss one more thing with this electrostatic voltmeter and that is a certain application for it that came in quite handy in 2008 seven years ago and that was for measuring both voltage and current of my Kelvin's thunderstorm now if you don't know what a Kelvin's thunderstorm is you can look it up there's lots of information out there but basically it's uh, an electrostatic generator that uses falling water droplets to to create very high voltages on, on the order of 10 to 20, maybe 30, 50 kilovolts you could get out of it if you design it well enough. But pretty much 10 kilovolts is what I was getting out of this. Okay, so I could hook up the voltmeter directly to these two different metal cans right here and measure the, the voltage coming out of here, the voltage that accumulates between the two metal cans. And that goes up to about, you know, 5 kV. That's as far as this thing can actually read. But if I want to actually measure higher than that, I've got to have some kind of voltage divider. Now this resistive voltage divider even though it's got a full 3 gig ohm resistance from top to bottom, it's not enough resistance. It needs much, much more for this thing to actually work with this thing because the current, current production here is so small and you've got to take every last um, um, nano amp into account to make sure that these things have extremely low leakage between the two of them and to ground. You, you want to to maximize your your charge building capability with this thing and so what I did was instead of using a resistive voltage divider I made a capacitive voltage divider each one of these 1.1 nanofarad caps is actually four series capacitors and I can show you the exact same chain of caps that I used for this experiment there it is, all eight of them, 4.4 nanofarads each. I don't have the actual Kelvin's thunderstorm to show, but I do have this original paper right here. So there's the electrostatic voltmeter hooked up across one half of that chain of capacitors right there, basically dividing the voltage from uh, from a 2 to 1 ratio. Now the actual capacitance I use here is quite large compared to the 12 picofarads that this thing has and the reason for that is so I could actually measure the current. So what I did 
was I just took the the time starting at at zero zero volts zero time and uh, at 1000 volts I measured it was two minutes 50 seconds when the needle hit 1500 volts that was at three minutes and 14 seconds and 2000 volt three minute 33 seconds and going on down the line up to almost five minutes for 5000 volts and over here in the right column this is the total number of seconds for the given amount of time and I plotted it all down here time and voltage and you can see how there's sort of kind of an exponential rise but what I was interested in right here is the part that's very easy to to calculate when it comes to the math just plug it straight into this equation very very familiar hopefully it should be familiar of the uh, capacitor current equals capacitance times the the rate of change of voltage so 550 picofarad which is of course just half of all this that's basically what it was charging this whole thing with these two in series 550 picofarad times rough estimate just by the graph here 100 volt per second and that comes out to 55 nanoamps and I just estimated it again roughed it out to 50 nanoamps and that's roughly the amount of current that it was using to charge up this thing anyway my whole point is that the electrostatic voltmeter had an extremely high input impedance of practically infinity and there's no way I ever could have expected to use something like this or something like that any kind of resistive voltage divider going into a, a, a DMM like that just would never have worked I really really needed a super high impedance voltage measuring device to actually get this kind of data maybe I could have actually measured some kind of dedicated uh, current instrument too, current measuring device but I don't know how I would have done that I'm sure there's something out there some some hack I could have probably done to use some kind of uh, current measuring instrument to measure the current directly but anyway that's what I used for this and it turned out pretty well I think all right that concludes this video series of a whole bunch of different analog meters of different types and different manufacturers and different voltage ranges and in this case how to actually use the the high voltage electrostatic voltmeter if you learned something then please give this video a thumbs up and thanks for watching I will see you later